plein air painting is French for painting outdoors, en plein air. Here's a whole bunch of paintings I did in Rome. I really uh, love plein air painting. I love to be outside and painting. Here is one of those in situ along the banks of the Tiber. Here's another one from Joshua Tree out in the desert. Here's another one from Carmel up by the ocean. And it's a, I think it's a great thing to do. They're a lot of fun, it's a lot of work. I, I'll talk about the palette in just a second. Here's uh, Porco da Tavia and the down, panning down to the palette so you guys can see what I painted it with. Here's the other end of Porco da Tavia. Again, like pan down to the palette. Here is under Ponte San Angelo. That was the Vatican Dome there. And we'll take a closer look at the palette. And again, there's another video on mixing this whole palette. But here's an annotated palette for you quickly, just so you can see what I'm using for the demonstration I'm going to do in just a second. And here is the demo painting at the end. And here's the demo painting along with the palette at the end. Um, so anyway, let's get started and do some plein air painting. Actually, here first is a checklist, which I think is a really good idea, especially if you're going out a little bit on site, you wanna make sure you have everything you need. So this is my checklist. Yours might vary a little bit, but make sure you have everything you need. All right, so now I'm all ready to paint and I have the things on my checklist. I got, I got brushes. I have some sort of little setup. Again, you can make a much more portable one than this, but whatever you have, just make sure you bring what you need because you want to do it in one trip, especially the further out you go. So I can get all this into a backpack, including the, the little tripod here. I have solvent, I have a palette knife, I have a little medium uh, stuff to paint on, so I'm all set. All right, so since I have a palette that's this gray, that's why I have the painting this same gray. And some artists will have the palette, uh, a wooden palette or a white palette, which is okay. But I think for me, it makes it so much easier and more efficient that how the paint looks here is gonna be a better predictor for how the paint's gonna look here. Um, another color that's used a lot is a warmer color like this. This is just burnt sienna and white. And one of the nice things about that is it really charges the blue, right? Because the main color when you're outside is going to be the blue of the sky. So this orangish earth tone really charges the complement, which is blue. So if I take a color here and put it on this, eh, it doesn't look that blue. Let me take a lighter one. I'm going to take a lighter neutral. There we go. It's going to look much bluer on this than it will if I flip this over and put it on the neutral. See, it looks a little cooler, but not really that, not, it doesn't pop like it does on the warmer ground. So if you, if you want, that's, the, that's one of the reasons you see a lot of landscape paintings with this sort of warmer ground color. I still like the umber color. I think it makes it, uh, I'm, I'm used to it. So it makes it much easier for me to have something that's a little more neutral. All right, so now I'm ready to get started. I have a piece of dye bond here. I find it really uh, convenient, lightweight, easy stuff to work on. I am gonna pick out what I'm gonna paint and I wanna keep it pretty simple. Uh, there's a temptation to sort of overwhelm yourself and wanna paint everything. Pare down a little bit, especially if you're just starting, you wanna paint something even a little more simple than what you think is interesting because once you get started there's always a lot to do so I'm gonna get started just like I do with the other media I want to start with some uh, just a pure dark without any white in it and make kind of a map right so I'm gonna start with one of these darker colors and keep it kind of thin. And you can sort of frame off even just with your fingers and decide what you wanna paint. You can use one of those little framing uh, sliding windows too and make it the same size as your painting surface and then use it to sort of crop your view and frame it. Um, but you wanna, you wanna make a decision so that you can start to measure things. So here's my little mall stick and I found this really useful. 
I marked it off, um, which made it even more helpful for doing architecture and that sort of thing. Because um, once you start, you just want to be able to have some way of measuring things, right? So I know that I want uh, a lot of sky. I'm going to try and keep it pretty simple as I just advised you guys to do. So I'll start simple with like a little bit of roof line. Now another good thing about the mall stick is I can use it to make straight lines, right? I can hold the brush against it, all right? Make little lines with it. So I wanna pick something as a unit of measure so that I can make decisions. So I have like a chimney over there if I take the height of the chimney right here as a unit of measure and see how many chimney heights wide I want to go, two, three, actually three, I could probably go bigger with that little chimney, keep it. So even though I just started it, I'm going to start over and go a little bit, I guess the placement was good, but I'm going to go over a little bit and go a little bit bigger. I want to make a decision about wh how I'm going to fit everything into my view. That's a little crooked. I might have a chance to fix it later. So I'm going to keep it pretty simple. One, two. So one, two. That looks okay to me. I have about two chimney heights to the side, maybe I'll shave it off a little bit. So for the architectural elements, I'm going to make a little bit of a map. So our friend Corot had this hierarchy for painting of form first, then tone, and then color in that order. That's a really useful way to break down the complicated problem of trying to paint things with this colored oil that we have. So form is just figuring out, I want to I have a good plan. It can also be very helpful to make a little thumbnail sketch, right? I guess my restart was almost like my thumbnail sketch because I, I, I basically started mapping things out and then restarted it. have a lot of little intersecting roof lines going on over there. So I just want to have get the form down and tone we're addressing in the organization of the palette as well. I, I have things organized dark to light. And again, if you're not sure where to put things or your palette's messy or you're just starting, just copy the way I organize my palette. I mean, there's a number of useful ways to organize it but this one's been pretty uh, useful. So when you measure, you always wanna lock your elbow, right? So some things are pretty organic, like trees are pretty forgiving with measuring, although they can also be um, a little unforgiving in details of foliage. So that is about where that goes. Now I have a little foliage behind there. I have, it's dark under here. So once you have a little bit of, of a map in, which I don't really have going that much yet. And again, I'm only starting with the dark, right? I don't want to put a bunch of white paint on because at this point, it'd be very easy for me to correct, right? I can, I can just dip, the, dip a little paper towel in something and wipe off where I made a mistake or where I have stray marks I don't want. Um, so that's why I don't start putting a lot of color on there right away. So now I have some foliage over here. I'm just gonna map out where it's gonna go. I actually see it goes above the chimney line over on this side. So basically I have a sort of a little window uh, for the sky is good because 
that's what I want to paint. So for my green, you notice I have no green on the palette. So I'm going to use my cooler ultramarine burnt sienna and yellow it a little bit. Let's see. So that gives me a very desaturated green. If you mix yellow and blue, it, the green is very saturated, almost like a artificial kind of color, which I don't really want. I just want to make up a little bit of a map. So we see things edge to edge, meaning you've probably all seen there's a, it's a paragraph and only the first and last letter of each word are correct, but you can read the paragraph once you get used to it. And I'm bringing that up as I start to block in this tree because it makes sense for foliage because the tree can make you kind of crazy if you start looking at all the leaves and think about trying to paint it, right? That's a lot. So I'm going to squint and look for the big shape and worry about detail mostly at the outside edge, right? It makes a lot of information pretty quickly. So now I have a little bit of the form in everywhere. I want to decide where my darkest dark is. So my darkest dark up in here, which is good since I don't have any, I have no white on, no white has touched this brush yet, so that's good. I can get good clean darks. My darkest dark is probably up here in this little chimney, or maybe under here, under this roof, under this little awning back here. That's pretty dark. So that'll help me get my... Uh, get my values going a little bit, but really it's the most logical place once you get things mapped in to start is the sky. All right, so I'm gonna start laying in the sky. And the sky is a good logical place to start because as things get further away, they have more sky in between them. So I have foliage here that has really dark darks on it. And as I get further away, the foliage will have more sky in between me and it. So if I literally even take some of my um, sky colors to push it back, especially if you have something that really has atmospheric perspective, like a mountain or something, that's gonna, that's gonna have a lot of sky color in it. Also the sky affects all the shadows. If you have a day where the sky is really blue, the shadows are gonna take on blue because that's the second brightest thing. So I'm going to get a big brush, actually I have a lot of clouds, which is kind of nice. I'm going to get a big brush and start mapping in the sky. I don't know if that's, so clouds have very soft edges. And I have a little bit of uh, sky showing through. Now when you're outside and everything's changing, you can look at it as a, a scary thing, or you can look at it as something you can take advantage of. And you can take advantage of it because you have options, right? I, I kind of like how, where I have, basically I have clouds and I have like blue up here in the corner and I have clouds going over to this corner. And then I have a little blue showing through here. So that allows me to keep my color my corners different from each other which is a good thing to try and do if you can oops except i just put i said it was blue and i put i put cloud color over it so i'm just going to start back with mapping in where some of these clouds are going and where i want some blue so we'll try it so this gray ground too, you notice I, I tend to, if I'm mixing a color fresh, I'll put a little dot to see if I like it. That's actually, as the sky gets closer to the horizon, right? This is more up high in the sky. This is a little bit lower. So I think I want a color more like this for up here. That looks a little, that looks a lot closer actually. So I also want to use in general as large a brush as I can control. 
right? So I'm gonna map things in. Clouds have very soft edges. So as I start mapping in uh, sky color, see I almost, I was just checking that because you wanna make things, make sure you're making things different from each other. Right, you want to differentiate things. Matisse said it's solely a question of emphasizing differences, which you can get a lot of mileage out of for painting. So I was just checking the height of these because oh, that's pretty close. I just didn't want to have them end up being the same. Also, if you're painting trees, you don't want to have them just repeat the shape. You want to definitely note the differences between the shapes and colors of things my sky so it's a little bit hard to see at first if you're not used to looking for a sky color that shift from up high in the sky to down lower but as you get down closer to the horizon definitely gets a little bit yellower and you don't want to leave you don't want to put the, the color flat everywhere in the sky because then it'll make it look like a green screen behind everything which is sort of silly um, the sky has depth and we're looking through more sky the closer we get to the horizon so there's there's a shift there we want to account for with the color right, so. clouds so I'm gonna try and lay in the clouds pretty quickly Now I'm going to end up painting over some things I'm going to want to re, uh, reiterate, like down here I had a little telephone pole, I had some trees back there, but if I want to get those sky edges soft, I might have to lose those things and then try and get them back. Um, also the sky, the clouds have more variation than I'm, I'm putting in, but I just want to start with something because they're definitely brighter in parts and darker in parts like they're where they face down they're a little bit darker in here that's a little bit darker so I can just look at the So when I get to the sky, I can kind of put a little bit of, just m sort of smush the edges together, right, to keep that softness I want to have in the sky. Um, and I haven't touched that brightest sky color yet, but I definitely have some up there. So I really want to, the sky is changing the fastest, so I, the stuff on the ground isn't going to change that much. If I know the light is gonna change a lot, then I wanna plan ahead. Usually you either paint into the light or out of the light. Meaning, if I know, right now I'm facing pretty much north. So the sun is going behind me like this. If I know I wanted this side lit later on, painting into the light would mean I would wait and paint that lit later on. If I want it lit where it's brighter here right now because the sun's over here, I would paint it right now. Although it's still darker than the sky behind it. Um, so it's kind of uh, planning a little bit, like taking into account where the light's going to be or um, trying to keep an effect that you have now. So it's kind of like uh, those, um, those, those Japanese restaurants where the food floats by. Like when you see something that you like, you have to kind of plan so you can well, at the restaurant, you don't have to plan, you can just grab it. But here, you might have to plan for your painting a little bit so that you can, um, so you can get what you want. So, back to big. Also, you guys will notice that I'm keeping the, um, keeping the brush, it, it's not real wet, it's not, doesn't have a ton of paint on it. I'm kind of using it to sort of scrub things together. All right, so I can plan. I think that might be the yellower. So I have a very bright cloud up there. 
time each time you touch something you kind of want if you can if you can get it right the first time you touch it that's gonna be very fortuitous for you it's gonna you benefit from a lot of kind of happy accidents trying to paint that way so some of the sky contrast is really nice and I got her it's very fleeting so again I really want to try and catch that while I can Once I start to get the big areas of the sky laid in and softened, so these edges soft, right? Even when this cloud edge looks hard to you, it's not going to be hard. And also, you want to keep your values very compressed in the sky. There's a tendency, like, oh, you see a dark on a cloud and you make it dark. This chimney, the local color of it, is white, but it's not as dark as anything in the sky. So if I, this is why these grays are very useful. I can just try and spot a color there. I think it's a little bit cooler, darker, not quite that dark. So the sky, once I start to get this little chimney note, I just wanted to put it in there so I knew if my sky had to come up or not, and it looks like my sky definitely needs to be generally brighter. So I'll start, I'll start brightening it up. Especially what I had up in here, that was really bright. So my ground color is a little dark, so maybe I tended to go a little dark. So especially where, where things touch, you want to make sure and notice the relative value between them. <clears throat> but not letting your sky get too dark or too contrasty is really important if you want to keep it looking like it's a sky. So I lighten all this up. And as I get over to the tree, I can't even try to work some of the detail of the tree by coming into it with sky color that's behind it. Now I'll soften it back up. Um, Corot had uh, something he called a luminous note in a painting. Try not to worry about too much, but he's like pick, pick a spot that is a, of a certain value. Sometimes you might think of it as the lightest light, but it's not always the lightest light, and only hit that note once. Um, if you, one of the advantages of painting wet into wet like this is that it helps me vary all these notes and keep things kind of together. So, you know what, I am not talking as much now, so I might go ahead and switch to time lapse so that this can come together a little bit quicker, and I'll talk over the uh, video so you guys can see the choices I'm making. Maybe I'll lay in a couple other little things, because I've got some darker darks on the roof. So really, I'm, I'm making a map, trying to start with uh, getting the sky going, and then worrying about my big, um, areas of value. Alright, I want to get that big notes in. I have, this is also
this is almost the ground color that I have, which is kind of a lucky uh, coincidence for me. May I'll leave it alone a little bit. And some of this is warmer. So I just I'm just trying to ballpark these big notes real quick. Because some of these roof lines have a little warm and cool. So this is pretty much the foundation for the painting. Um, so from this point, I'm gonna be finessing. I'm gonna go back and work the sky and try and work my way through the whole painting and work up the foliage a little more. Um, so we'll switch over. Time to lapse. So this will go a little quicker. I'm continuing to work on the sky, laying in uh, areas that are lighter and darker and then softening them to keep them looking like clouds working my way through the rest of the drawing. You notice my big areas of color and value stay pretty distinct from each other, which is why you wanna start with a good plan so you can keep your colors um, from getting in your way as you work on the painting. And you notice I did end up using all the colors that I put out on the palette, and as I continue to work, the colors are continue to be organized from dark to light, top to bottom. So really just trying to work my way through all the way up to the last little uh, details I'm putting back in there, the telephone pole and a little bit of foliage. And here's the, here's the painting at the end with the palette from it. Uh, so I hope that's useful. Let's take a look at just a cloud study real quick when time lapse. So here's just a cloud by itself. I'm just gonna try and paint this cloud before it goes away. Um, and I have a little bit more variety of the colors we mix for the sky. You can see the gradations of uh, from the bluer blue at the top to the slightly greener at the bottom. I'm paying a lot of attention to where that cloud's a little darker than the sky behind it and mostly lighter than the sky behind it. I start with mapping out the shape I want and really use the cloud to get the colors specific um, and try and finish it that way. Because really you sort of have to half invent it um, but I thought it would be useful because clouds are, clouds are actually fun to paint just to show you one start to finish quick. Here's the hastily finished cloud at the end. Uh, so I hope that was useful for you and I hope you'll enjoy plein air painting. I really, I enjoy it quite a lot so I hope you will too.